And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to coming to us coming to us straight from the other side of the pond, and the creator of Braith Shattered Realities, which which is which is currently currently on on World Anvil and and some content on Drive Through RPG. The one and only Heiner Devent. How are you doing today, man? Or tonight in your case? Damn time zones. Yeah, hi there. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, pretty good actually. It's been a great day for concerning both weather and uh, my progress with my project because, as you just mentioned, uh, I'm not only on drive through RPG but also Roll20 and uh, currently in the process of converting that uh, entire setting to Roll20 mm -hmm. and made some great progress there, so pretty good mood today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So. I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, what was your first introduction to role-playing games, and what made it stick? My first game was actually, a, let's call it a German clone of D&D. That's how it's often presented. Uh, it's called the Dark Eye, or... Mm -hmm. uh, Das Schwarze Auge here in Germany, mm -hmm. and um, a friend of mine um, introduced me to it. I was, I think, about 14 or something, and uh, we had a small group of friends, and we started playing it, experimenting with it, and we all just loved it and kept going for years. And um, yeah, after school, um, I had a bit of a break concerning role-playing games and um, later met a friend uh, that introduced me to D&D um, and since then I kind of got stuck with D&D, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, with, the, with that in mind, was... when it, came, when it comes to... when it comes to Braith, um, was this was this a setting that you that had kind had kind of evolved from your from your own D and D sessions, or how, how did it come not. about? Absolutely not. Um, I kind of got the idea while creating a world map. Um, so I got Incarnate, the uh, map making software, and um, experimented with it, mostly for just making stuff for my own campaigns. Mm -hmm. And um, I experimented making a world map. And the more I worked on it, uh, I, I really was very, very happy with how it turned out. And as I was working on it, these ideas started to come up so basically, while creating the world, I made the first ideas for the entire setting. And uh, I was just putting evocative names uh, on the map. And uh, that kind of led to all these ideas that in the end became an entire setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, there's, there's a lot of directions that one can go when it comes to fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've that I've championed. It's something that I've been very critical of cer of certain folk when they um, treat, say, the what I call the Tolkien melting pot as the way you're supposed to do fantasy, which mm -hmm. it isn't. Um, and I I know people do that because I remember being in forums and people saying that plain that Planescape was too weird to be fantasy. Um, which. If that sound if that sounds ridiculous, that's because it is. <laughs> but I'm an absolute Planescape fan, so I'm absolutely on your side. <laughs> well, it's only too weird to be fantasy if your if your only understanding of fantasy is again what I call the Tolkien melting pot, which mm -hmm. is that's the term I use for this for that for this Western Europe pastiche 
that that um a lot of people view as fantasy that's Tolkien adjacent, but not really. Um, mm-hmm. but is very is very much rooted in in um Western Europe in general and more specifically the British Isles. Yeah. Um and I've I've long suspected that the reason that The Witcher became so became so popular is because because of it being a being a form of fantasy that pres- that leaned more towards Eastern Europe instead instead of what instead of Western and a mm-hmm. lot of the motifs that people that people see with that. But what sort? But what style of fantasy are you shooting for with Braith? This is a question that is both very easy and very complex to answer. <laughs> Those are the best questions. Um, yeah, um, complex because um, the concept of Brave is that uh, basically the worlds you play on are the remnants of worlds that have experienced an apocalypse. Mm-hmm. And uh, my core world with which I start um, is called Shangri. And it's basically 11 regions or fragments of that old world that were saved and merged together. And so you have these entirely different biomes and cultures that in the past world where where they came from were maybe continents away and didn't have anything to do with each other. And now they are neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that's basically just the very first world to begin with and there are massive chains that connect these worlds to each other so you can basically just walk over a chain and into a different world and what that means is that campaigns in brave can basically be anything you like Mm. you can even if you want to uh, do a clone of Spelljammer because um, Wraith is not just the setting, it's basically a microcosmos. It's an alternate reality of its own mm-hmm. and there's this, uh, I call it the purple void, which fills the entire universe and the worlds are floating within this void, within this purple void. And you can even go into this void if you have the proper equipment like void ships and things like that. And you could absolutely do something like a Spelljammer-like campaign in Brave. But Mm -hmm. you can also, and that's uh, basically the starting point um, from the official course setting that I produced, uh, you can absolutely do a Tolkien-like setting. I have the uh, region called Delvaroth, which is not entirely like Tolkien's setting, but there are a lot of elements of that. And I used that because it's easiest to get into. Mm -hmm. And it's like um, you can start playing in Brave with that region, and uh, it's pretty easy to understand because we all know these kind of worlds. But if you want more, you don't need like, oh, how do I get my group now to the other side of the continent? No, you just go to the next country over the border and there's um, oriental setting or an ice desert or an ocean of ash or you jump into the purple void and do a void ships campaign. Mm-hmm. So uh, in other words, it can be anything that you want. Um, but, and um, there's more of, an, of a philo- philosophical um, point of view. Um, I think every setting has a kind of theme and sometimes it's very obvious, sometimes it's subtle. Like, for example, if, you, if we talk about Ravenloft, it's obviously gothic horror. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely clear. And um, I was thinking very long about what kind of theme I wanted for Brave. And um, I came up with something because it's kind of, um, yeah, something that both personally is interesting for me. And it's also something that I really 
have a passion for. And I think it's extremely important. And that's basically psychology. So um, from therapy and uh, uh, trauma stuff and all that, uh, I am actually considering, I'm, I haven't made the final decision on that yet, but I'm considering to maybe become a therapist one day. Mm-hmm. And um, basically as a secondary career. Uh, and even if I don't go that way, I have researched very much and I've made trainings in that area and so on. And um, the theme of grace comes from trauma therapy and it's from surviving to thriving. So the core idea is that you've got a world that has gone through an apocalypse and uh, in the timeline, it's uh, the, the world, the new world shaped from the remnants of a world that was destroyed. It's there only since four years. So it's not like totally uh, yesterday that it happened, but it's still very fresh. Mm-hmm. And everyone has gone through a lot of crap. And from that point on, the question is, how do we get from not just surviving, not just living in this hell that we experience, but building a new world and going for hope and going for a happy life despite all that happened. Mm -hmm. And that that is a interesting thing to explore, especially since a lot of games that that dip into post-apocalypse are very much in the leaning of science fiction. And yeah. you know, you know, your when a, if I mention if I mention post-apocalypse to a lot of people, the first thing that they're going to think of is Fallout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Probably. Pro- hopefully, Fallout New Vegas if they if they have proper taste. Um, hof- hopefully not Fallout 76. Never played that one. I love how that's an evergreen take because it's never going to be finished. I will al- <laughs> I will always be able to pick on it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Look, all critics have their whipping boys. <laughs> Mine just happens to be Todd the Mop Howard. <laughs> but... Oh, but fantasy, fantasy, fantasy apocalypses, they're they're they've been present, but you don't see them as frequently. Um, yeah. And even even with that, the the whole con the whole concept of from surviving to thri- to thriving is a concept that I don't see often. A lot of t- a lot of times in post apocalypses, it's usually it's usually you have some variety of. While people are surviving, the world is still fucked. Yeah, exactly. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't th- I don't like the idea of that being the be all end all. So it's nice to see some ver- some variety in that sense. Yeah, and honestly, if we look at the state of the world, um, I think we can all need some uh, positive views on the future. Look, there's a, there. I've got I got in my I got some heat a while back because I said cynicism is boring. <laughs> mostly because I know I mostly because mostly because it is, and while I got heat for that, nobody could actually counter it. So, <laughs> so it's a so for me it's a case of why are you, why are you booing me? I'm right. Yeah, I understand that. But what? But what I what one of the th- I will admit one of the things that that um stood out to me when I was when I um when I happened to cross Braith was the way was the way you handled the map because this is a far more colorful map than you tend to see in a lot of fantasy games. Yeah, that's true. In a lot of in a lot of. A lot of fantasy maps that you'll that you'll see, with with some rare exception, are very very much very much have very much 
have one all, have one all encompassing type of biome or one all encompassing type of environment. Mm -hmm. Um, usually, usually, usually some usually some variety of how much forest is in the, is on this place. But yeah. what I noticed with the map of um, Ashan Asha, Asha, Ashandri. Ashandri. Is the fact that you is the fact that you have a lot of different biomes, and given where I come from, that's a welcome change. Um, <laughs> was that was that something that you in, that you intentionally did to reinforce that whole that Braith can Braith can have just about any kind of setting? Yeah, a set. Um, the setting evolved together with the map. Mm -hmm. So uh, the very first thing. Why this came into uh, being at the very first uh, um, place, basically, it's um, I was experimenting on doing world maps. So I started doing different biomes, basically, just to see um, how do I do these. And I didn't want to do like seven different maps, so I just started doing that on one. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, I was like, hmm. That's interesting. What if this was an actual world? <laughs> and uh, well, things basically just uh, became alive on their own from there on. Mm -hmm. Now, we mentioned the we mentioned the chains. Um, how easy or difficult is it to cr to cross chains between co between um, world continents? Uh, it's well, I think it's comparable to journeying through a desert. Like, uh, there aren't many resources, um, probably even less than in a desert, because there is no natural life there. Um, so you have to bring enough food or spellcasters that can create food and water, things like that. Um, but that aside, um, it's actually pretty easy. You can basically just walk straight ahead and uh, sooner or later you reach the other world. There are some dangers, like uh, there are things like chain quakes and uh, there are certain creatures that might happen to be there. They aren't native because the chains don't have any native life, but there are creatures that you might encounter there. Um, but as, unless it's like a deadly encounter with uh, some kind of foe, it's quite easy, actually. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in with that in mind, um, when it comes to given given the sh given the sheer amount of biomes, um, what would what would you say would be would be certain pla would be the most likely places to 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 essentially act as a hub for adventurers getting getting started with this kind of setting. Um, well, based on the existing content, that would be um, the land of Delvaros, uh, which is very much, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's very much uh, oriented on uh, Tolkien and uh, Forgotten Realms and uh, all these things. Um, but you basically can choose any area you like. Mm -hmm. And if you say you want to start an oriental campaign, um, I have the Amber Wastelands, which are, uh, well, kind of Arabian Nights with a twist, um, because, uh, the, or actually with two twists, because first of all, there's a very strong presence of fire elementals there, and um, they, had an, a very strong influence on the entire culture and that's actually where the whole Arabian thing comes from because there's uh, a whole backstory with a uh, higher elemental sultanate uh, in the background and um, that is one thing and the other thing is that it's actually not a human um, culture but the most dominant race of the so-called ember orcs it's uh, an orc race which is highly civilized and um, yeah they they basically uh, had 
the biggest impact on the entire culture. And if that's something that speaks to you, you can just start there. And uh, if you want anything else, like, for example, uh, um, an Arctic campaign, there's uh, the ice desert of Varua. And um, you can simply apply typical desert things and just skin them a little different. And it's easy to make your campaign start there. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, in with that in mind, have would would this set would this settings be able to support a hex crawl type of campaign? In in your opinion, I think it's not laid out for it. Um, you could do it, yeah, but I think there are settings that are a better match for that. All right, I I can I can certainly get I can certainly get that. Oh. Now, within given the given the given that particular given that particular style, since you mentioned the a um a a far more civilized take on orcs than what than what people would usually think. Um, I like to I like to bring up a few other races and whether or not these are and decipher whether or not these are present within um within Br within Braith and how if that if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to start with one, like to start with one of my favorite ones to pick on, that being the elves. Mm -hmm. Um, they do have a very big presence, and uh, I actually have um, for all of the races that are part of the SRD, um, I have my own sub-races, mm -hmm. and um, for the elves I actually have three different sub-races, um, and I try to, you know, there are the standard elves that you know they are there but i wanted to give elves some new twists so um one of the uh sub races i have uh, are the shadow blood elves and they are basically like they have this pantheon of gods called the old and yeah i have chosen that name uh with, of course, great old ones in mind and uh, Cthulhu and all that, because uh, these elves were basically shaped by this pantheon of gods, and uh, they are the race aren't really aberrations, but they are very close to being something like aberration elves, and mm -hmm. um, they have equipment that, uh, like for example, you have a shadow blood living which looks like a mixture of tentacles and vines and teeth mm -hmm. and uh, they use that in combat and uh, they are really creepy and nasty and basically my uh, version of evil elves that I have um, but they also have a twist because uh, when Ashandri uh, shifted to the dimension of Braith after the apocalypse a subgroup of these elves kind of waked up like from a trance mm -hmm. and they suddenly realized like what the hell have I been doing and uh, that doesn't mean that they necessarily became good but they stopped worshipping this pantheon of gods mm -hmm. and uh, so there are now uh, shadow blood elves that you can use also as player characters or as uh, non-player characters that don't have to be evil um, but it, it raises the question of those that still serve the old why do they really do that are they really evil or is it some kind of influence of the gods and uh, you know there's a lot of mystery there and uh, I plan on solving a few of these things in future adventures um, but uh, to come back to your question I have 
uh, several kinds of elves, and I always try to give everything a new twist, a new um, a new perspective, something new to try out to keep it interesting, and not just mm -hmm. do things that a million other set settings to uh, do too. Yeah, and. With that in mind, I'd like to, I'd be curious how you'd handle the other end of that spectrum with the dwarves. Yeah, uh, the dwarves. Um, also, classic dwarves are around, absolutely. Um, they were a very present race in the old world, but uh, their big cities were mostly underground, and when the new world was shaped, uh, there were like big earthquakes going through the entire world and every single one of these major cities was destroyed. So basically uh, most of their culture was destroyed and there are many refugees from those that survived. Mm -hmm. um, and there are also a few um, cities above the ground. Um, but uh, the, the core of their culture basically was destroyed. And uh, I also have a sub-race uh, for them. They are the so-called Kruvar Dwarves. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a creation of one of their gods, uh, which also has a little bit of a background story. It's actually an evil god, mm -hmm. but not shunned by their pantheon. Uh, it's actually an ele earth elemental god. god. And uh, the background story here is that the uh, uh, prime god of that pantheon was uh, working on anvil, very classic dwarven theme, and was uh, hitting on a rock with his mighty hammer, and only too late noticed that the rock in front of him was actually an earth elemental and it shattered into two pieces and uh, the god uh, felt horrible for doing that and uh, managed to save this creature but through the pain through the suffering it endured uh, it basically turned evil and um, full of rage and anger and um, to make up for his deeds that um, prime god turned this elemental creature also into a deity and welcomed it into his own pantheon. Mm -hmm. And with his newfound power, this elemental created this sub-race of dwarves, these children of Kruvar, and um, they are like elemental rocks, like their skin really looks like stone, and they uh, about half of them have black eyes and um they have very they have a very harsh society um but despite being creations of an evil god they are not all evil like their societies definitely have an impact from the evil side but you can be a good person and live in one of these cities mm -hmm. and you are still accepted there mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to go into something a little bit more unorthod unorthodox when it comes to races. Um, yeah. Tieflings. A po a popular a popular approach, not for not for the reasons I usually use them since I always I always have tieflings go um in in far more of a gypsy aesthetic, but would but given given the approach of t of tieflings as des as descended from people who made deals with devils, um, how would that translate into Braith? Yeah, it's uh, honestly one of my personal favorite sub races that I created there, and uh, that is entirely subjective. Um, but a bit of a background story here: um, the dominance of the humanoid races in the old world that was destroyed um, that happened about 4,000 years ago and before that there was uh, dominance of other races like giants and dragons and all that mm -hmm. and the way the humanoid races gained superi superiority um, was very very much through making deals not necessarily with devils and demons and stuff, 
but also so making deals of any kind was a very very common thing and supernatural entities have since millennia had a major impact on the world and they used their offspring for whatever things they had in mind they wanted to achieve in their world and uh, with all that influence going on new strategies came up like um, for example an angel or a fairy might see okay there's this devil that's uh, creating offspring among humans and um, I have no idea what bad plans he has but that can't be good so I'm going to um, elude the bloodlines and also create offspring with them and this happened over millennia over and over again and uh, there were like influences from a variety of sides like mm -hmm. Yes, the fiends had the major influence, that's why they are called tieflings still. Mm -hmm. But there are so many influences from supernatural creatures that nobody really knows what's in that blood anymore because it's just so much. And uh, this has an absolute impact both on their kind of powers they have um, and also on their visuals like their skin is totally colorful. You have patches of different colors all over the body, through the, the face and the arms and all over the body, basically. And uh, you might have two entirely different horns and your eye colors might be different on both sides and so on and so on. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, I call them Rectech tieflings because of mm -hmm. that, because there is nothing like a clear structure and you can even go so far that uh, um, when looking at them if you imagine looking at them as a person in front of you it's like where the hell do I look first because it's so so much and you can of course also be a bit calmer a bit, a bit tamer um, but yeah they are very colorful mm -hmm. um. When you mentioned when you mentioned that the first thing that came to mind is the horse of a different color from the Wizard of Oz. It's actually a story I never read or saw, <laughs> uh, so I can't really comment on that. It was it was a horse that was constantly changing colors. Mm. Oh. but given but given given that kind of mixing with with supernatural is. Would Dragonborn be be in a sim be in a similar kind of kind of setup, or would would it be f much different? Um, I could imagine that these things also happened with Dragonborn, but uh, I haven't made a race for that or sub race. What I have made is actually a sub race that's called the Spell Vessel Dragonborn, and um. Let's just say they have a very bad fate. Um, because the idea of a spell vessel dragonborn is that um, you are not only infused with draconic essence, but also with pure magical essence. And this process is horribly painful. And um, they are created or, or they have been created only by evil dragons because um, the process is so painful that even if two spell vessel dragonborn have children these children still when they come into this world have this basically transgenerational memory of pain imprinted into them and um, they are designed to be powerful slaves, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them might have escaped in the earlier times, but uh, many of them actually got their freedom after the apocalypse. So for them, it was actually a good thing, kind of, um, because maybe their, their dragon masters uh, died or they just weren't around. 
and they took the chance to escape. And uh, these spell vessel dragonborn, um, also they have like this uh, magical spirit inside them. And in most cases, it's like a bad voice, like basically uh, having an inner critic, but this inner critic is actually an entity of its own and it's a real asshole and it's designed to keep them down and um, if we get back to the whole topic of from surviving to thriving it's like if you make a spell vessel dragonborn player character you could start as like you've always heard someone whispering in your mind how worthless and how bad and whatever you are and the story of this player character could be to grow beyond that and to understand this kind of gaslighting and actually find themselves. Mm -hmm. And when it and when it comes to one of the one of the things I was curious about is in re, is um in regards to magic. Um Given the fact that we're de that we're dealing with a a post apocalypse, is the way ma is the way magic works or the way magic is treated the s the same or are there are there changes with how it's tr with how bo either or both work in Braith? Um, I have two different approaches here actually. Um, first of all, I'm a big friend of keeping things easy. Mm -hmm. So, if you want to play a campaign in Brave, um, the core idea is that everything works as intended because you can focus on the story, you can focus on the setting, you can focus on your characters and not on how do I apply this rule, what do I have to keep in mind here and so on. Mm -hmm. So, that's an important part for me. But, um, Wraith is, as I mentioned, a microcosmos of its own, meaning it's uh, not a multiverse, but a universe. And this universe doesn't have things like elemental planes or an afterlife or anything like that. And uh, that's actually a pretty important factor in the setting because in the very first five days, uh, after Ashandri shifted to the dimension of Braith, it was cut off from the afterlife. And anyone who died in that time basically became a ghost, or uh, how I call them, unbound spirit. And these cannot die anymore. They, even if you kill them, they just get back the next night. And uh, so these are things that have an impact on the world. And um, you can, for example, use Brave in a way that it's actually a bridge between alternate realities because how it accesses afterlife and elemental planes and so on is via conduits. Mm -hmm. And nobody says that, for example, if you have a conduit into the plane of fire and there's another conduit five miles uh, past, uh, leading to that same plane, who's to say it's the same alternate reality that it connects to, this, the same other multiverse that it connects to. So, in theory, you could have even things like two versions of the same god from different realities. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely possible. Um, I didn't really weave much of that into the setting itself because of the first part, I want to keep things simple. But you can play with it as a dungeon master if you want to. Mm -hmm. Now, from what from what I, from what I had seen, there there are some there are some additions to the to the um, player facing end of Braith, and that's that is something I'd like to. I would I would like to get into especially since you made a you made a whole separate page dedicated to um uh warlock patrons. Yeah. Uh what can you tell specific specifically the one that's the one that's currently in the world anvil is the shore spirit. 
Um, what can you tell me about that, and what and um, what um, players who have that as their patron would lean into? Um, the Shaw Spirit um, is actually a. Uh, yeah, it was a demon, and as mentioned, supernatural influence in the uh, old world of Earthers before the apocalypse was a pretty common thing. So yeah, there were demons and angels and all that walking around. And um, this particular demon ended up in uh, the new world in what is called the Drift, and it's basically like a giant world storm in the land of Ash, an incinerated land. And this magical world storm, it ripped this demon apart. But it put it together again also, but merged with that ash. So it was turned into something entirely new. And um, this, this drift has created what is called the uh, River of Ash, which is a massive stream that splits the land of Delvaroth. And um, after it was ripped apart and put together again, this uh, demon creature was basically going down the stream until it ended up uh, on a place where today there's a city called Blackbad. Mm -hmm. And um, the spirit, the shore spirit, lives there at the, sh at the shore. And everyone knows about it. And it's known that you can make deals with it. And as mentioned, that's pretty popular and common thing. And yeah, it's uh, maybe kind of stupid to make a deal with a creature you know is uh, evil. But if you're desperate enough or if you just don't care, uh, then there are people who do it. Mm -hmm. And um, this creature, it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of a uh, treasure hunter and um, it has pretty bad intentions um, about basically bringing down culture and um, making everyone like uh, enemies to each other mm -hmm. and has visions of being uh, the, the lord of its own realm, basically. Um, and you might end up as a warlock absolutely willingly, or maybe because you were desperate or whatever, and that was your only option you saw, and then you made the deal because you just saw no other way to solve a problem that was important to you. Mm -hmm. And um, so this... Um, the Shaw Spirit might give you missions very directly and uh, opposite to most patrons, you can actually visit it physically. Like you go to that shore and it comes up and you can speak to it, mm -hmm. just like that. So uh, that's definitely something that makes it easy also to create a, a Warlock character because you can just say, yeah, I uh, lived in Black Bad, I had problem whatever, and I des desperately had to solve it, so I went to the Shaw Spirit and made a deal. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one of them. And uh, I already created two other Warlock patrons also. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's, that's kind of interesting because I didn't really have the intention to do that. But uh, one of my playtesting groups, um, there were two players who had the idea to make Warlocks and they had very specific ideas in mind. And I basically designed these Warlocks uh, patterns for them. And they are two patterns that are connected to each other. And one is, um, you could call it a fallen angel of death. Uh, so not an evil creature, but a very bitter one and the other patron is his sentient sword so it's basically like a magical weapon with uh, its own intelligence and its own agenda also and uh, so in my group I have two warlocks from patrons that have a story together and this is just beautifully playing out and it's so interesting and uh, 
the uh, two patrons, they are available al already on my Patreon. Mm -hmm. And um, they will also be part of the extended core setting that is going to Roll20 soon. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, um, what would, since this is, since, from what I understand, this is your, this is your first go at, at, um, do, at creating a campaign setting, what, what have been some of the lessons that you've learned in, de in developing it and playtesting it? There are so many that it's uh, a question of where to start. <laughs> um, well, first thing is um, from a very, let's call it business point of view, um, you have to have patience. It's not like the world has waited for your product, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And um, Everyone who has seen the setting has given me extremely positive feedback. Um, there was really, I've, I've been talking with many people and uh, there was no one who said it's, it's not for me or that, that's crap or whatever. Um, and I have received extremely positive feedback, um, but still it's not like uh, it's selling by itself. Absolutely not. And um, I am absolutely aware that it will take years before this is going to be really successful. And I always expected that and that's something uh, I came with that mindset and I was still surprised how hard it is really to get it out there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the first learning. It's really, I knew it's a tough industry, but it's even tougher than I expected. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately for me, it's an absolute passion project. And even if it will take 10 years, I will just continue working on it and uh, creating stuff for it. And it's, it's just fun and it's, uh, I love doing it. Mm -hmm. So I have the patience and that's a good thing. Um, and it's, it's also, um, to keep on the business aspect uh, on it, you know, it's not like selling, for example, new magic items or something or new adventures that you can apply to any setting. Having a setting of its own is really something that people have to kind of devote to. If you do this, it's like you start a new campaign for it. I mean, you can, of course, also just say, like, I, I pick parts and pieces of it, or I have my campaign and I make a little detour uh, to that uh, uh, alternate reality. It's all possible, of course, but uh, the core idea is, of course, to use it as a setting of its own. And that means you start a campaign there. And not everyone is at that, pain, uh, at that point. So naturally, it's pretty hard to really get it out there. And um, I absolutely expect that it will take a long time um, be before it becomes big, but um, I'm here for it and I will keep pushing it and I will keep working on it. And um, I think I'll get there one day. Mm -hmm. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day. Exactly. <laughs> And as mentioned, everyone who has seen it has given me positive feedback and I have received some amazing reviews by now already. And uh, so I do see that people love it and uh, that makes me super happy and that also makes me confident that it will become big one day. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. And have you, give, have you given thought to... An I'm not, I'm not sure if you've done this already, but pu but putting in some sort of in se in setting one shot. Um, I actually have released uh, two adventures, and one of them is a one shot mm -hmm. um, that 
comes with a location description. So you can basically do the one shot, shot and then uh, just stay in that location and do additional adventures. There are adventure hooks and uh, NPCs and uh, location descriptions and all there. Um, and that can absolutely be a uh, start into the setting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will certainly keep an eye out for, keep an out for that. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to my <laughs> temple. I'm very thankful for being invited. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As thank I you. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then on behalf of the good brothers present and not present my name is Mildra I am your gaming monk stay Fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>